bread. It's concepts with pivot. You understand just how we live it. This for me is like rap religion. Open on B, cause we got this skype. When it come to this, y'all, I can get it hype. When it come to this, y'all, calm has risen. How you living, huh? Yo, how you living, pivot? So during this stand-up comedy journey, I got to sit down with all kinds of people and probably the guy who is the most kind of iconic and has been around the longest, I think he holds the record for the most appearances on Johnny Carson. Uh, Tom Dreesen, the great Tom Dreesen, sat down with me and his, his words meant so much to me. And he's so articulate and so, so wise. You know, he's a straight shooter, um, and it was it was also very uh, inspiring to hear his words. Uh, I've never told anyone some of the things he said to me because they kind of wouldn't believe me. So you can hear it for yourself. And it's the last episode of the year, and thank you guys for riding with me. It means everything. It really does. Happy holidays, everyone. Are we rolling? Yeah. We rolling? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do that question again. Okay. Actually, I thought you were. Can, can Can we even think of an actor who has successfully transitioned into stand up? I can't, and I can tell you several who tried: McLean Stevenson, uh, Jamie Farr, uh, uh, Damon Wilson, who was on Red Fox's show. He was on Sanford and Son. They all had this great popularity, and they were comedic actors and good ones. They had this great popularity, and so they tried to do stand up. They would come to the improvisation or the comedy store in those days and get up. And when they first got on stage, the audience went wild because this was a star. You know, and, and, it's, and you'll always get that open reaction. But after five minutes, you better have an act. See, after five minutes, that wears off because then it's time to show us your material. Mm -hmm. So I would advise anybody that uh, like you, a good actor and a good comedic actor, if you're going to do this and you're going to be serious about this, and load yourself up with ammunition, and that's material. That's what you have to work on morning, noon, and night. And it, it, it almost has to become an obsession with you because everything becomes material. You know, and, and that's the only way. You're an actor. If you didn't do uh, any acting at all for six months, you had a dry spell, or even eight months, a year, and pretty soon you get, and all of a sudden, I don't know where your agent calls you and says, get over there right away. They want to read you. And you haven't done a scene with anybody in a year, are you going to be sharp? Hell no, you're not going to be sharp. What good is a break if you're not ready when the break comes? Mm. Every stand-up comedian that's good today will tell you how hard they worked on that material, original material. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and the other line is, Jeremy, you know, I think Candid Camera had the greatest hook line, caught in the act of being yourself. Originally, all new comedians start out doing an impression of another comedian. I can watch a new kid working in an open mic night and I'll say, oh, he likes Jerry Seinfeld or he likes David Letterman or Jay Leno or whatever. You can see the way they're working. But when you're new, so you're doing an impression of, a, of a, another comedian. But then one night you let a little bit of you out. And if it doesn't get a laugh, you go back into doing this impression of a comedian again. One night you let a little bit of you out and it gets a laugh. Whoa. And then next time you, you let a little bit more of you out. And pretty soon you start evolving, caught in the act of being yourself. Picasso said, try to paint like another artist, I dare you. Mm. You'll fail, but in doing so, you'll find out who you are as an artist. Mm. That's brilliant. And, um, I, you know, I've been influenced by many, many comics um, and probably unknowingly have been mimicking their cadence or whatever. But I think if there is good news about me is that I'm blissfully unaware and delusional if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Good. And, and Good. <laughs> you know, in, in the way that I love comedy, I really do. And I've watched it my entire life and, and, and watched stand up and been in awe of, you know, George Car Carlin to, you know, Lenny Bruce and, and, and Chappelle and everyone in between and all that stuff. But I don't have any choice but to be my authentic self. Mm -hmm. I really don't. The, the couple of mistakes you can make along the way, you know, one is comparing yourself to another comedian. I teach young comedians all the time. Never compare yourself to another comedian. That's the first sign that you're going to fail. You'll say, gee, I started out with Jeremy, and, and he's already doing the Fallon show or the Kimmel show, and I started out with him. And, you know, 
your biggest mistake is when you compare yourself to another comedian. There's a great Hindu proverb that says, there's nothing noble about being superior to another man. True nobility lies in being superior to your former self. Am I a better friend than I was last year? Am I a better father than I was last year? Am I a better neighbor than I was last year? Am I a better comedian than I was last year? Your tapes from last year. You listen to your tapes, or your Today We video. You know, you watch, have, have I grown? Your only competition the rest of your life as a stand-up comedian is your former self, what you were as a comedian last year. I st sit here and tell you, and I, I give motivation speeches at universities, and I do it for comedians, too. I call my, for comedians, it's called the joy of stand-up comedy and how to get there. And I talk on four subjects, perception, visualization, self-talk, and develop a sense of humor. And I elaborate on those four subjects. Mm -hmm. But I will stand in front of the class and I'll say, I'm a success. I'm an absolute success as a stand-up comedian. And you might say, how can you be a success? You started out with Jay Leno and David Letterman, and look what they accomplished and how much more money they have and more much fame than you. I was never in competition with David Letterman or Jay Leno. I just wanted to be the best Tom Dreesen I could be. And I did that by, you know, looking at my former self. And that's what you have to do. Your growth, it may come fast, it may come slow, but we never stop growing as comedians. It's, it's never, there's never, okay, I finally arrived. The good comedians know you never arrive. You know, we're only as good as our last performance. Dick Sean years ago used to say that singers, uh, most people live from day to day. Singers live from song to song. Comedians live from joke to joke. At the end of every joke, your option's up. You know, your option is up. And I can teach you a lot of things. Joke structure. I can teach you, let me start with joke structure. Comedy is two things when you're writing a joke. Number one, it's nine-tenths surprise. The audience laughs because they didn't think you were going to say that or do that. So the setup line has to hide the punchline. And the other rule is there are no victimless jokes. Who's the victim in this joke? You know, what I can't teach you is timing. You either have it or you don't. Now, comedic timing in film is one thing. Comedic timing on a stage is another. It's even hard to describe what timing is. You know, and the best way I can describe it, first of all, if I did the set that I did here tonight for 20 minutes, mm. That piece of material. Let's say I did that same material, like when I was opening for Frank Sinatra. If I did that same 20 minutes in front of 20,000 people opening for Frank, it takes on a totally different dynamic. And that's where the timing comes in. And the best way I can describe timing, and it's hard to describe, is say you have a big pond of water, and you throw a rock up in the air, and the rock goes high in the air, and it comes all the way down, and it hits that pond of water, and it ripples across the water. That's laughter. Some nights, you never move on that line, on that laugh, when the laughter's on its way up. You just killed your laughter. You know, so some nights, it's always when the rock is coming down. Some nights when the laughter is coming down, I move right there. Some nights I move here. Some nights I let it hit the water. And some nights I let it hit the water and ripple all the way across the pond before I move on my next line. What allows you to be available to understand those cues? There's, it's my thing about timing. You either have it or you don't. I know a lot of people that do stand-up comedy mechanically, you know, but there's, a, there's, a, an, an, there's an, an instinct that knows, when, I, when I'm going on stage, I don't prepare. When I was opening for Sinatra, there was 20,000 people out there, and they didn't come to see me. Yeah. They came to see him. That's heavy lifting. The, the, How do you navigate a crowd of 20,000 people that didn't come to see you? Well, you, you, first of all, the one thing, I, a trick I used to pull, when you walk out there, you know, here, let, me, let me describe uh, the, the orchestra was said, bah, bah, da, da, bah. people said, whoa, bah, bah, da, da, bah. Right. ladies and gentlemen, ah, let's welcome the comedy star of Showtime. Whoa. <laughs> so I'd get up there and the first thing you got to do is you got to take command of that stage. So I'd get up there and I might say, how many of you out there thought that Frank Sinatra was coming out? Applaud. Those of you who thought Frank was coming out and they'd applaud. I'd say, See, I know how, just how you feel. I'm a little bit disappointed myself. Right. Yeah. Joke's on me. Right. Then I'd say, how many of you out there in this arena for your very first time applaud? And they would applaud. I'd say, how many of you out there are seeing Frank Santa live for your very first time applaud? They'd applaud. I'd say, how many out there aren't wearing any underwear applaud? <laughs> Here's my point. Set up, set up. I talk, you react. Mm -hmm. I talk, you react. I'm training them mm -hmm. to applaud. I didn't say raise your hand. I said, so I'm talking, they're reacting. Now I'm, now I'm getting them. You know, they're, they're getting in, caught into my cadence. I'm talking and you have to react. And then you start slowly, you do a couple of local jokes, always whatever city you're in. You, you, I learned that years ago from reading a book about um, the, the old time comics. 
um, they, they, they would, like in vaudeville, they would come to a town and they'd find mm -hmm. Uh, uh, like th what was going on in the town, they'd open with one or two local jokes, right. you know. But and then then you're on your own. Then your stuff better be good. But right. then it was in the round. There's twenty thousand people, so you're you're working here and you're working here and you're working here. And that's why comics with f f with their jokes relied on facial expressions weren't successful at that because the audience couldn't see when they're when they're working over here. But monologists, I'm a monologist. They could hear the punchline with my back to them. You right. Know? But you got to you got to work it like they're in your living room. Right. By the way, I'm babbling here, but I'll give you some no, other it makes advice. Everything you're saying makes sense. Uh, Jeremy, whenever you walk out on the stage at night, it's, it's like this. It's, 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 it, if you have a wife. Do you have a wife, by the way? I don't. You know, okay. But that's a, how much time do you have? We'll get back to it. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> I got a, a, a slew of divorce jokes. Okay. That's the other thing. Whatever's happening in your life is material. Yeah. Show them your pain. Carl Reiner told me years ago, Tommy, you want to make them laugh? Show them your pain. They love to laugh at your pain, you know. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J. Piven will be right back after we pay some bills. Yes, Manscaped. Thank God for Manscaped. This thing is saving me. Fellas, this episode of How You Live in J. Piven is brought to you by our favorite producers of ball trimmers, Manscaped. The global leader in below-the-waist grooming are leaving 2021 with a new product, Clean yourself into the new year with their ultra premium body wash. Listen, special offer alert right now, 20% off. If you use the code PIVIN, free shipping at manscaped.com. Four million men already trust Manscaped. Are you kidding me? 2022 is on its way, you guys. And the last thing you want to do is be the guy with pubes getting in your way of making this year your best year yet. Listen, so many things suck out there but manscaping isn't one of them. Manscaped engineering the ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent, functionally, and incredibly comfortable grooming experience. All right, this tool is amazing. I am confident, because I use it, that the 4.0 is going to leave 2021 and the gross pubes with it. Shed it all. Let's go, you guys. Use the code PIVIN, 20% off, free shipping. What are you guys waiting for? The code PIVEN, P-I-V-E-N, at manscaped.com for 20% off free shipping. Just use the code PIVEN. I celebrate each and every one of you and your balls. God bless you guys. Ah, MeUndies. I can speak personally about MeUndies because I'm wearing them right now. Crazy, beautiful, original patterns, onesies. So soft, so good. It's officially a winter wonderland outside. So what do you need more than anything? You need to feel good. And what do you want to do when it's chillier than a snowman's cheeks? You want to bundle up with layers and layers of comfy goodness. That's what me undies feels like. Spread the cozy vibes. Get me undies. Are you more of a onesie person or a matching PJ set with the fam person? Either way, they're the perfect gifts. I'm telling you, there's not a single person that goes, oh, really? You're going to give me this? Everyone wins with this. It's so hard to get gifts for people. Just make it easy. Get me undies. Me undies has a great offer for my listeners. For any first time purchase, you get 15% off and free shipping right to your door. To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, 100% satisfaction guaranteed, go to meundies.com slash piven. That's meundies.com slash piven. I mean, 50 years is a long time. Was there a moment when you went from good to great? And do you remember what the variables were that took you to that place? You know, the, 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 when you first start out in stand-up comedy, you'll do, you'll, you'll bomb, you'll bomb, and, and, and then you'll, you have a night that went pretty good. And then you get a little confident, and then you'll bomb, and, you'll bomb, and then you have a good night. And, then you, and pretty soon you had two good nights in a row. And then pretty soon you had three good nights in a row. Now, now, here's when you become a pro, when you start getting consistent. And then time goes by and you have 10 good shows in a row. Then you have a bomb, you know, and then, you know, and then as time goes by, you start getting better and better and you start realizing you're putting, you haven't had a bad show in 20 appearances, you know. So that's when you start knowing. But to me, the real deciding point, I was with a comedy team six years. Tim Reed and I were America's first black and white comedy team. That's right. History shows we were the last. Um, we wrote a book that's now going to become a movie. We're on the final stages of that, of what it was like touring the nation when there were no comedy clubs. 
working all black clubs in the North and the South, what they call the Chitlin Circuit, and working all white clubs in the North and the South. I'd be the only white guy in an all black situation. He'd be the only black guy in an all white situation. So we, we worked off of that. You know, and, and, but when the team broke up, and I came out here and I was struggling at the comedy, trying to get on at the comedy store. I couldn't get, I had to wait in line like everybody else. I finally got on one night and Mitzi saw me and put me on the regular schedule. A year later, I'm getting better and better, but a year later I did my first appearance on The Tonight Show and I scored. And that's when I knew, that's when I knew. That one appearance on The Tonight Show, your whole life changed in those days. Everywhere you went in America in 1975, people say, what do you do for a living? So I'm a stand-up comedian. The next question out of their mouth was, oh yeah, you ever been on Johnny Carson? If you ever been on Johnny Carson in the eyes of America, you weren't a comedian. Right. You might want to be, you might going to be, but you weren't one now. One appearance, Freddie Prince got a sitcom the next day. 26 million people watched that show in those days. I did one appearance, CBS signed me to a development deal the next day. I was in the unemployment line the day before. I had a wife and three kids. I couldn't get rent money. And the next day, CBS signed me to a development deal and I've never stopped working since that time. But that's when I knew if I could do that show, and, and then when Johnny called me over to talk to me on the third appearance, that's when I felt I had arrived in show business. And then from then on, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. took me on the so road. you got to do four minutes of clean material. Six. Six minutes. Five to six in there, yeah. Six minutes that kills on national television. Yeah. How nervous were you before the first one? I, I'm, I'm, another thing I teach young comedians is how to stay calm, how to stay within yourself, how to, how to stay calm. But, but uh, I'm not, I'm not a nervous comedian. I love going out there, I enjoy it. But that first Tonight Show, I cannot describe you what that's like. You go there, I got put in makeup. Now they, they take you to your dressing room and then they'll call you down to the green room and they bump me, they ran out of time. They told me to come back next week. I come back next week, I'm in makeup. I go to my dressing room, down to the green room. Ready to go? They bump me. They bump me three times in a row. The fourth time I'm there, I'm in the makeup room. Fred DeCordova, the producer, comes in and says, I got bad news for you. I said, what? He said, you're going on tonight. <laughs> now, you start feeling something, you know, a lump coming in your throat. <laughs> I don't want to say it because the lady's here, but I always no, say, but I always say, you know, you're getting ready to go on, you feel something nudging your Adam's apple and you realize it's your asshole trying to get out. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> you haven't eaten. And we, but right. I'm behind that curtain and 26 million people are going to watch this show. Not only that, every talent coordinator, every Every, uh, there's um, uh, agents that are watching the show. There's um, booking agents for Vegas and stuff like that. Everybody is watching that show, including my mother back in Harvey, Illinois, that she's got all the people from the neighborhood. Well, I can't, if I bomb, I can't even go back home. You know? mm. So the pressure is enormous. Something key again, Johnny Carson says, after come on a commercial break, I'm behind a curtain, ready to go out. He said, we're back now. And I'm glad you're in such a good mood tonight because my next guest is making his first appearance on The Tonight Show. Will you welcome Tom Dreesen? That one line, I'm glad you're in such a good mood tonight, sets that audience up. You know? Again, because he was a knowledgeable comedian. You know? he, knew, he knew how to set them up. Mm -hmm. That also is part of reading an audience, you know, that you're gonna, you're gonna you know, in, in your career, you know, let me, let me get back to this. In acting, they teach us about the fourth wall. How important is that fourth wall? That I gotta say, fourth wall, you know, for those who don't understand what I'm saying, stage right, stage left, these are walls, you know, upstage, these walls. The audience, you put a wall there, an imaginary wall there, that's the fourth wall. So that I can sob and I can cry, because you're dying and you're my friend and you're my, and I can't picture life without you. And I can sob and I cry, because they're not there. But in stand-up comedy, we tear that wall down. You gotta go out there to them. Here's what I was gonna tell you. Yeah. Every night for, when you're going out on stage, you know, I, I tell young comedians all the time, here's the way it should be. Pretend that your wife is saying to you, Jeremy, I, we got 40 people out there for dinner and I don't have dinner ready yet. It's not gonna be ready for another 20 minutes. Go out there and tell them some of your stories. Tell yeah. them about where you were growing up in Chicago and, and, and about your early years in acting. Go out there, those funny stories you tell, go tell them. So when you walk out in the living room and say, dinner's gonna be ready in about 20 minutes, but I gotta tell you something. When I first started studying acting, that's the same way you approach the stage every night. Like, this is our house. This isn't their house. You're in your living room. Most comedians get stage fright and all this stuff because they, they envision that these people, this is their home and we're invading their territory. No, 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 they're invading our territory. If they could do what we do, they'd be up here. They can't do what we do, that's why they're out there. Yeah. So this is my house. Every stage I ever walked on, Caesar's Palace, I worked Vegas for years, all the, all the big showrooms. When I walked out, 
I pretended this is my house and look who's here in my living room. And dinner's gonna be ready in a few minutes, but let me tell you about when I was going to Catholic school and then, you know, that sort of thing. That's the way you approach it. You own that stage. That's right. <clears throat> That's awesome. You're talking about going up and either changing your life or bombing. Mm -hmm. And six minutes of clean material and no one can understand. Now I get it because I've walked through this. That is the craziest pressure that you can experience. Wow. And th the fact that, you know, it's so, so interesting. You got bumped four times, but the fact that you can walk out there and be calm and own that space, as you said, you're all in my living room, let me just hit you with it. That's what it's all about. But the moment you start getting into your own head about fears and doubts, all of these different things, that will help to eat away at your timing. So you've got to somehow fend <coughs> off those voices so that you can stand and be present and mm -hmm. deliver your timing. Well, again, it's, it's, it's again, that caught in the act of being yourself. This is, if you never remember anything that I say, remember these lines, conversation, not presentation. It's a conversation I'm having with this audience. Is it your act? You damn right it's your act, but it's your job to make it look like it's not an act. Right, this is but isn't every act completely different? Every, every, what are you talking about? Every every performance that I that every, if I you mean the same material night after night? Yes, of course, because the audience is different. You know. No, but <clears> what <throat> I'm saying is everything you just said is is absolutely true, and it is a conversation. Um, and at the same time, you you and I are both from Chicago, but you're from a different generation, and your perspective is different. Our our acts are different. Oh yeah. Our energies are different, yeah. so it is a conversation, but at the same time, there are some that say to me, Jeremy, stop performing. It'll eat you up. And I hear it, and I take it in, and I get it, and it has value. At the same time, I'm a performer. Mm -hmm. So I've got to walk through those. And then there are moments where it's totally conversational, like you said. So why can't it be a little bit of everything? Well, it can. See, again, you have to decide what kind of comedian you want to be. You know, you, you, you know, uh, how brilliant was Richard Pryor? Richard Pryor would be doing, I felt like uh, where I grew up in Harvey, he grew up in Peoria. I felt like I was on a street corner again with, with the brothers when, mm -hmm. when Richard was doing, doing his monologue. But every now and then he'd step out of his monologue and become a character, Mudbone. Right. He, that's where he used his acting skills mm -hmm. inside his monologue. And that's fine with you, that'd be perfect for you. Right. You know, you're an actor, you know. So if you're describing about a guy you just met at Ralph's store and he's pushing a cart, you're gonna become that guy and you're gonna enhance your stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, if you can m blend the two, stand-up comedy, Jeremy Piven, caught in the act of being himself with a conversation, not a presentation, but he steps out of that once in a while do a character for you with his skills. Hey, you just enhance your stand-up 100%, you know. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Piv, and we'll be right back after we pay some bills. If you are looking for ways to skip, why not save time and money with Stamps.com? The most important thing we have is time. It really is. And money can't even buy you time. But in this case, it can. Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS all year long. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. I mean, look, you don't want to wait in those lines. You go crazy. That's why they have that term postal. Don't go postal. When you're selling online, running an office, side hustle, we all got side hustles. Stamps.com can save you so much time and money and stress during the holidays. Going to the post office instead of using Stamps.com is kind of like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. Sign up with the promo code PIVIN for a special offer that includes four-week trial free postage, and digital scale. Go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top, and enter code PIVIN. Away thoughtfully designed suitcases, bags, other travel things. All they think about are awesome colors. Different shapes, sizes, locks that work, 360 spinner wheels. Very important when you travel, believe me. Modern materials, compression pads, so that you can pack more than you'll ever use. Packing is difficult. They make it easy. Laundry bags to keep things tidy, need those. Um, all anyone is thinking about is travel. Mom, dad, your loved ones, great gifts. 
People you don't love. Well, you don't have to give them anything. But if you're thinking about it, then give it the gift of travel. Explore a ways, full range of things, travel, and start your 100-day trial today. Just go to awaytravel.com slash Piven. That's awaytravel.com slash Piven and give the gift that's on everyone's mind. And there aren't a lot of people that can do that, Right. what you're doing. Right. So then the quest for me, and forgive me, the quest for me becomes how do I evolve with the writing, with the observations, with all of the techniques that stand-ups do, because that's because the performance I'm loving and getting. It's, it's the writing and the evolution of the writing. Oh. It, it, I'll say this to, you know, to every young comedian I talk to today, men or women, if you're not a good writer, you're not gonna be able to survive in this business. You'll be able to come up with maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Who knows, maybe you might even come up with a decent 25 minutes. But we're in a constant state of writing all of our lives. You know, somebody once said to me, and it's a very good question, are you a writer that's a comedian or are you a comedian that's a writer? I said, wow, that's a good question because I'd say I'm a comedian that's a writer because I love stand-up comedy and I don't enjoy writing, but I know I have to do it. So everything that happens here today, I never, I never leave the house without a pen and paper. She'll say something, she'll say something, there's some, some and I, ooh, I know how to, I can turn that into some material. You know, how long did it take you to really think as a comic? Oh, I, I, you know, I, when I, in retrospect, I probably always thought like when, when I was a little boy, I gravitated to laughter. I loved to hear the sound of laughter. I was shining shoes in all the bars in Harvey. And, excuse me, my mom was a bartender, and, um, and I had eight brothers and sisters, so we were shining shoes, setting pins in bowling alleys, caddying, selling newspapers to feed the family. But in this bar that I'd go to where my mom was a bartender, the guy behind the bar was my uncle, my mom's brother-in-law, and he would tell jokes to the customers. And I was fascinated that with his inflection, with his, his uh, vernacular, he could cause this sound to come out of everybody's body that filled the air like electricity and, and united everybody. All these different people were all joined together. And I, I was fascinated by that. I, I am only too happy to show them who I am. Good. It's a gift because I've been playing fictional characters, yeah. playing them truthfully, with all the authenticity that I can possibly muster with every part of my being. And then when you're then confused, and then there the fictional ideology is placed on you, and then you're vilified, this is a whole other conversation, that's an interesting journey. But to now be on stage with nothing to hide, showing who I am and presenting that, that's the greatest gift ever. Yeah. So I welcome it. And you know, if I bomb and they hate me, Take, you know, take your shots, but I, I just want my day in court. Well, and you're going to get that <laughs> opportunity. And you're going to, and there'll be nights you're going to go home on cloud nine. There's going to be nights you're going to go home feeling so bad. Oh, yeah. Because we take that personal when they don't, when they, when they don't like, you know, but again, basically you're going out and when you, as Jeremy Pippen, you're going out into a group of strangers night after night after night. These are strangers. And you're essentially saying, love me. I want you to love me. First of all, they got to like you before they laugh at you. You know, they got to know who you are. I always tell every new comedian, your first 10 or 20 minutes in comedy, tell me about you. Tell me where you're from, so I know where your accent's from. Tell me about your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, whatever. Tell me about uh, uh, your childhood, going to school. Tell, so at the end of your set, you say, boy, that Jeremy Piven, was he funny? And by the way, you know he's from Chicago? And you know he studied acting? You know he's been actually been acting since he's a kid. Right. And you know he went to Catholic school or private school or wherever he went? And he's just like us. Yeah, and, and, and that's the other thing, we're every man. You know, we, we have pain, we have heartache, we pay taxes, we have, you know, a, a daughter dating a punk rocker or whatever. Right. You know, but that, they, they walked away and not only did they laugh at you, but you left part of you out there. They know about you. That's what your first 20 minutes. Then yes. you can talk about the government and the airlines and your opinions and all that. But first, tell me all about you so that we now we know who you are. That's the foundation of your act. Could you imagine yourself if you didn't find stand up? No. I was wandering aimlessly. I didn't know what I wanted in life. I'd find myself, I, I was married, had three kids, four years in the military, come back home. I, I, I'd be sitting in bars with my buddies in, in Chicago at two o'clock in the morning saying, I don't belong here, but I didn't know where I belonged. I just, I, I used to pray, God, please, there must be something I'm supposed to be doing on this planet, this can't be it. D going from job to job, doing well at those jobs, but never feeling fulfilled. This, 
emptiness was in me. One night I go on stage with Tim Reed and something I had written got a laugh and it was like an epiphany, like the dark clouds opened up in a, like these B movies and a sun burst through. My whole being went, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to be a stand-up comedian. I couldn't sleep that whole night. I got up the next one. It was a Friday night. On a Saturday morning, I went to church. There was no service. I got on my knees where I used to be an altar boy, where I sang in the choir, where my mother sang in the choir when she was a little girl. I prayed. I said, God, I now know what I want to be. I want to be a stand-up comedian. If you let me make my living as a stand-up comedian, I'll never ask for anything else. I'll do charities. I was making all these promises. A few years later, I want to put an addendum to that contract. But, <laughs> but my point was is, is that I now knew that this is what it was I was supposed to be. And, and you will feel that you, you already have felt that or you wouldn't want to be doing this. That calling, you know, that, I almost, like they used to say about the priesthood, it's a calling. Stand-up comedy is a calling. It really is. Because when you can, look, let me do something real fast. Why stand-up comedy is the greatest profession on the planet? That you're, you're embarking on the greatest profession on the planet. First of all, insurance companies of America did a, a survey around the world many years ago, for eight years, about the 10 fears of man. Death was fourth. Pain was second. Getting up in front of the audience was the number one fear of mankind. If you can get up in front of an audience as a house painter and talk about being a house painter for an hour or a lawyer or a doctor or, or a bartender, you're in less than 1% of the population of the world. If you can get up on stage and make people laugh for an hour, you're in less than one millionth of 1% 1 of the population of the world. Mm -hmm. You know how unique you are, how unique the stand-up comic is? It's the greatest profession on the planet for this reason. Also, Norman Cousins, who wrote the book, The Anatomy of an Illness, and he wrote another book called Laughter Math, he was dying of a heart ailment. The doctors had him in the hospital. They said years of stress, negative input made you ill. He had a short time to live. He left the hospital and thought, if negative input made me ill, positive input should make me well. Mm. He would only watch I Love Lucy reruns, Candid Camera, Three Stooges, The Marx Brothers, comedy albums. He would read the newspapers and wouldn't, wouldn't also would not um, listen to the evening news. He laughed himself back to health. He lived 27 years after the doctors told him he was going to die. And because of him, UCLA did research on what happens to the human body when we laugh. They found out that endorphins are released from the brain into the bloodstream. After when you have a hearty laugh, that's why after a hearty laugh you go, oh, and the mm -hmm. sense of well-being comes over you. Your body's gone through an actual chemical change. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching comics work, a comedian work, the brain can't think of two thoughts at the same time. It, can't, it can only think of one thought at the same time. So if you're watching a comic work, you're not thinking of your problems. So laughter is psychologically a deterrent. Mm. And now we find out because of the endorphins into the body, it's physiologically therapeutic laughter. So comedians are physicians of the soul. And that's why it's the greatest profession on the planet. Mm. You make people healthy for your service. When mm. you go on stage, they leave your, 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 your show healthier than they were when they came in. Mm. Wow. Good luck on your journey. Oh man, thank you, my man. Oh, that was that was profound. How You Live in J. Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy and Tenderfoot TV. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. Executive producer for cast is Harley Roman. Executive producers for Tenderfoot TV are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Executive producers for Common Enemy are Jared Einson and Dave Osco. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in J. Piven every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts.